Earlier this week, one of my differential equations students hit me with a question I didn't expect. Where does the quadratic formula come from? Now, if you haven't heard of this class, differential equations is basically the most advanced math course in the first two years of college. So these are really smart students who've been using algebra for at least half a dozen years, and they've already passed at least two calculus courses, and yet I think this knowledge gap is really common among our most advanced students. And this was a really good reminder for me. I don't think I knew where the quadratic formula came from until I started actually teaching math, and this is despite completing multiple degrees in mathematics and physics, so that means I probably used the quadratic formula literally thousands of times before it occurred to me that I should know where it came from. So how does this even happen to us? My guess is that I never even saw the derivation of the quadratic formula in high school math, or if I did see it, I simply wasn't ready to care about understanding mathematics at a deeper level yet. And then, of course, all these basic algebraic tools simply became second nature, and I forgot to question them with the same rigor that I learned later on to apply to more advanced topics. So this video is for all the algebra students out there who really care about understanding the math they're using. And if you're in that camp, I applaud you, and you should know that your unusual level of mathematical maturity will serve you well. But this video is especially for the more advanced math, engineering, and physical science majors. You might be realizing right now that you don't really understand some of the basic mathematical tools that you've been using, and it's time to go back and apply your mathematical maturity to the foundations. So here we go, and I want to point out that I always present the quadratic formula as an if-then statement. If ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero, then x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And this makes it totally clear what the a, b, and c are in the original equation and then in the solution. So how are we going to construct a solution to this thing? The trick is to wrap up all the x dependents, so these first two terms over here, ax squared plus bx, in a single squared binomial. And if we can get that done, then we can find the solutions by taking the square root of that squared binomial. Now, of course, this trick has a name. This is called completing the square, but for most algebra students, the process of completing the square is handed down as a recipe to be memorized without any deeper insight, which of course means you won't retain it. So I want to get through this process while hopefully motivating each step as just a common sense, reasonable approach to isolating x. So again, the point is that I can wrap up all the x dependents in a single squared binomial on the left-hand side, and it's going to be easiest to write this binomial down if the leading coefficient is 1. So let's just divide by a. So that leaves us with an x squared as our leading term, and then we have a b over a times x, a c over a for our constant, and then we still have a 0 on the right-hand side. So now we'll just move that constant of c over a over to the right-hand side so we can focus on wrapping up these variable pieces in a single squared binomial. So that gives us a negative c over a on the right-hand side. And now we should be able to guess the binomial that we square to get these two variable pieces plus some additional constant that we don't care about yet. So I'll go ahead and visualize this as a squared binomial on the left, capturing those two x pieces. And if I'm going to square a binomial and have the result start out with x squared, then that binomial must start with an x. So I have x plus something here that needs to give me an x squared plus b over a times x. Notice that when I square that binomial, I'm going to end up with a constant term popping out as well. And we're just going to figure out that side effect constant later. So just to make it more clear what happens when I square a binomial, remember that means just multiplying it by itself, and that just makes it a little easier to see how to guess what this unknown term has to be in order to give us the correct linear term b over a times x. So what I noticed when I square a binomial is this is going to start with x times x, that's x squared, so that part's done, and then I get 2 times the cross term. So I just put a question mark in there. So x times question mark plus another x times question mark. So if you get 2 times the cross term there, we're going to get the correct linear term if we take half of this coefficient b over a. So I have a b over 2a in each copy of this squared binomial. So now look what happens when we square this binomial. I get x squared 
I get x times b over 2a and another x times b over 2a, which gives me b over a times x. And now I can see what the side effect is of wrapping up all my variable pieces in a squared binomial. There's a constant b over 2a multiplied by another b over 2a, and that gives me b squared over 4a squared. So by writing the left-hand side in this form, I've implicitly added b squared over 4a squared to the left-hand side, and that means I have to do the same thing to the right-hand side. Now, if you're comfortable showing all those steps without expanding the squared binomial into two terms, that's fine. I was just trying to make it a little easier to see. What we have on the left-hand side now is x plus b over 2a all squared. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to go ahead and combine these two fractions now. So I need a common denominator of 4a squared, which means I'm going to multiply this first fraction by 4a divided by 4a. And that gives me a negative 4ac over 4a squared. So when I add those two numerators, and I'll just turn it around so the positive term is first, I get a b squared minus 4ac, which of course is bringing some bells here, divided by 4a squared. And now that we have all of our variables taken care of with a squared binomial, I can solve this equation by taking the square root. There are two solutions to this equation. One of them is when x plus b over 2a is equal to the positive square root of all this stuff on the right-hand side. The other one, the negative square root of all that stuff. And now we can clean up the square root a little bit. Remember, the square root of a fraction is just the square root of the numerator divided by the square root of the denominator. So I have a plus or minus square root of the numerator. So we're seeing that square root of b squared minus 4ac. And then divided by the square root of 2a squared, which is just 2a. So finally, I'm going to subtract the b over 2a from both sides. And notice I have like denominators on those two terms already. So I can go ahead and just get my final answer, solving for x here. And it's going to be negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And there it is, the quadratic formula, offering us an instant solution to any quadratic equation written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. And if you're a STEM major, you can count on using this thing thousands of times. And of course, we're not going to just stop with the quadratic formula. I encourage all of you to feed your inner skeptic every chance you get, question everything, and try to root out these old gaps in your knowledge. And when you do find a gap like this, make the effort to shore it up with your own derivation if you can. And it's totally fine to just look it up if you can't figure out the derivation. So if you've been majoring in a math-rich subject for a couple years, you already have the mathematical maturity that it takes to revise your understanding of these older topics, and that process is going to make you stronger and more adaptable in your subject.